You guys, thank you so much for being here. My name is Tiffany Olson, and I have been at the College of DuPage since 2006. And I've served in a couple of different capacities since I've been here. I've taught the Speech 1100 class, which a lot of you are in now. Um, some of you may be putting it off until your very last second when you have to take it. Um, but right now I work in the Learning Commons, and the Learning Commons is the academic support center here at the college. Um, we offer everything from tutoring, uh, they say from accounting to zoology, so it's A to Z What if you need help in a class. We also offer uh, math assistance, and then we offer reading, writing, and speech assistance. And that's where I work, is in the reading, writing, and speech assistance area. We have students that come in that need help on papers, students that need help on presentations, and you're welcome to come in to us. Um, there are no charge for our services, and we've got back on the back table, there are some flyers and handouts uh, that can give you a little bit more information about the services that we offer. I also do some corporate coaching, and I work in the business world with um, sales and marketing people that are trying to represent their product and represent their company in the best way, and so I help them do that. And with all of that experience in the classroom and, and in the reading, writing, and speech assistance area and in the the business world, visual aids have become a lot more prevalent. But just because they become a lot more prevalent does not mean that they become a lot better. In fact, I think people um, sometimes struggle with how to make an effective visual aid. Um, for those of you that come in late, we've got a couple of seats up front if you want to grab a seat. Um, and in fact, a lot of times people don't know quite what to do with the visual aid. And I know your teachers, especially if you're in the Speech 1100 class, uh, require visual aids. And I have students that come in and they say, I don't even know. I don't know what to do and then I give them some suggestions and they're like oh that's cool I didn't know it was going to be that easy so today I'm going to talk to you about why we use visual aids different types of visual aids and then I'm going to give you some tips for preparing and presenting your visual aids um, I want this to be interactive so if you have questions at any point if there's something that doesn't make sense or you want me to elaborate on please let me know because I do want this to be helpful to you, not just an opportunity for you to earn extra credit or to fulfill a requirement for your class, but I really want this to be helpful to you. So let me know how I can make it that way. There's an old adage that goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think that these two following pictures really show that to be true. I mean, let's say I was giving a speech on how to make a sand castle. Um, and I was going to say, oh, you know, you can do really creative, cool things with it. My words would never be able to describe how cool that is. Okay? And so sometimes a picture can do more for you than your explanation of it. Alan Klein tells us that it has been said 80% of what people learn is visual. 80%. So I want you to think about when you were taught to tie a shoe. My son is five years old, and, and we're teaching him now how to tie a shoe. And when you were taught that by your teacher or your parent or whoever, um, they probably said words while they were showing you what they were doing. They didn't just say the words, okay, make the bunny ears or whatever you're supposed to do. They, they showed you on their own shoe or on your shoe while they were doing it because 80% of what we learn is visual. So it's a lot easier for us to comprehend the message and for it to stay in our minds if we're shown what it is. And while it is true that words have power and can cause people to change their minds, to think and act differently, to feel differently, sometimes those same results can be met without ever uttering a sound. What's your reaction when you see this picture? Shout it out. What words come to mind? What feelings? Sweet. Sweet. What else? Caring. Caring. Lifespan. <coughs> Lifespan. I feel nostalgia for my grandparents who didn't get to meet my children. All right, that conjures up a whole lot of emotions in us. Just this one picture. And I want you to think of using visual aids for the following two reasons. First, if it's going to save words. So don't show us, or don't just tell us about the results, but show them to us. If I were to try and explain this whole chart to you verbally without you seeing anything, that would take a lot of words. But I'm able to just show it to you and point out the parts that I really want you to understand. And the second reason I want you to think of using visual aids is if their impact would be greater than the spoken word. So like this picture here, I think this picture is beautiful and I wouldn't even know how to explain that, but it also conjures up emotions and images and uh, emotions and feelings. Um, and so if you're able to 
not describe an image, but instead show it, that's when visual aids are really helpful. According to publicspeakingproject.org, visuals can spark interest. They can build emotional connections. Think of the old man with the baby that builds an emotional connection with the speaker. They clarify your words. Think of the bar chart. Explain abstract ideas, help draw conclusions, and increase understanding. It can be argued that there are three parts to an effective presentation. There's a message. The message, a concise, logical, thoroughly researched message. And then there's the delivery. And your delivery should be engaged and conversational and rehearsed. And then there's visual aids, visual aids that enhance the, visual, or the, the verbal message. But you can have one or two of these and not have three. In fact, you probably see it all of the time. Um, a speaker who's got amazing delivery but doesn't have a lot to say. Or flip side, a speaker who's got a lot to say but doesn't have amazing delivery. And like I said, visual aids are, you know, a lot of people have them, but a lot of people don't have them done well and <laughs> effectively. According to publicspeakingproject.org, because your message is the central focus of your speech, you only want to add visual aids that enhance your message and show what words <laughs> fail to clearly describe. For instance, let's say you're giving a speech on the evolution of the computer. You might want to show a stack of books. And that stack of books would represent how much information a computer memory can hold. Let's say you're giving a speech about hearing protection and how we need to protect our ears. You might want to bring in some um, earplugs, show the audience how to use them, how to put them in, and then blast the air horn. And that right there is going to be a really good demonstration for how important important hearing protection is. And that visual is going to do more than perhaps your words could have done. Done well, visual aids can have a profound impact on your audience and your overall message. The brain processes information differently. Um, it processes verbal and visual information separately. And because of that, visual aids are really important because it gives us the opportunity to see and to hear something at the same time. And that working in conjunction with each other makes the message clear and makes us more likely to remember what was said. And we can learn more by hearing and seeing together than we can by hearing or seeing alone. So think about the things that, like I talked about the tying of the shoes, but think about things that someone needed to show you in addition to just telling you words. Like I'm teaching my nine-year-old how to sew and if I were to try and teach her how to sew on a sewing machine without having the sewing machine there, that'd be really challenging. Um, but because she's gonna be able to hear my words and see at the same time, the message is gonna stick. So let's talk about why we use visual aids. According to Stephen Lucas, he wrote a textbook called The Art of Public Speaking. He says there are three reasons why we should use visual aids. The first is to help the audience retain information. Help the audience remember. So when you leave here today, chances are you're probably going to remember some of the pictures that I showed you. You might remember the picture of the earplugs and the air horn. Or you might remember the picture of the girl dancing on the beach. Or you'll remember the picture of the old man. It helps you retain the information. And not only are you going to remember the picture, but then you're like, what, the old man, what? Oh, that's right, emotional connection. That's visual aids can help build an emotional connection. It's going to jog your memory and help you remember things. The second reason is to clarify ideas. It's one thing to list a whole bunch of statistics, but it's another to show statistical trends in a chart that will help us really understand the point you're making. Think back to that bar chart that I showed you. Um, you don't want to just read us all of that information, but show us on the, the, the chart. It makes it a lot clearer to us. And the third is to maintain audience interest. I mean, we love watching public speakers, right? It's the most fascinating thing in the world. But it's a lot more interesting if they have visual aids with them. Give us something else to look at, something else that's going to really engage us and make us remember um, your presentation. The University of Pittsburgh Speech Center adds two more reasons. They say to provide clear organization. Sometimes um, speakers will have their main points on their visual aid. That way you know where they are in the presentation. You know what's coming next. And the other is to enhance the speaker's credibility. How can a visual aid enhance the speaker's credibility? How would you say? 
Yeah. I guess like if they show like statistics. If they show statistics, good. Because statistics are supporting material that help prove your claim. What else? Yeah. Because you're visually seeing it occurring. It's not just because you're saying it, but it's happened before. So yeah. Good. She says you're, you're visually seeing it happen. Um, think of like a, a commercial, like a Tide commercial. Um, that bolsters the credibility when we can see the stain coming out in the, in the, uh, in the wash. Okay, it bolsters credibility. Uh, the book, The Principles of Human Communication, they tell us two more. It can improve persuasion. A visual aid can help improve persuasion. Think about commercials. Think about, um, have you seen those uh, Feed the Children or um, the infomercials? It improves persuasion because we've got these sad kids in these dire situations and they're hungry and they've got the bloated bellies. And then I'm thinking, my God, I got I to gotta call. I need to support these kids. It improves your persuasion. And then the other one is it helps combat stage fright. I'm sure for some of you that are giving presentations, it's comforting to have something else that the audience can look at besides just you. That's comforting. Um, you want to make sure you don't take it too far. Sometimes students um, really know how comforting that is, and so they've got a lot of visual aids up there and a lot of things that are going to take the attention away from them as the speaker. You don't want to take it too far, but it is helpful to have something else that the audience can look at. There are many possible reasons to use visual aids in your presentation, but your guiding principle should be, does this visual aid make the message clearer or more memorable? And if you can say yes, then go on. And if you can't, then you need to go back to the drawing board. If it doesn't make it clearer and more memorable. I used to require, when I taught the Speech 1100 class, I had my students um, bring in visual aids for their speech. And I had a student one time, several years ago, when the smoking ban on campus was new, and his visual aid that he brought in, he was trying to persuade us that it was a bad idea to have a smoking ban. And his visual aid was a pack of cigarettes. And that was his whole visual aid. Do you think I thought that was a good visual aid or a bad visual aid? OK, a bad visual aid. I did. And why, why did I think it was a bad visual aid? It didn't provide persuasive aspects of cigarette smoking. OK, it wasn't persuasive at all. It didn't do anything to <laughs> persuade the audience. Why else? Any ideas? Okay, because they just banned smoking on campus and then he brings cigarettes in. Yes, that's also an option. Have you guys all seen a pack of cigarettes before? Okay. It was nothing new. It was nothing novel that I was like, oh my God, I haven't, I haven't seen that before. I haven't thought of it that way because I've seen a pack of cigarettes. What could have been something that was more impactful? He's persuading us that a smoking ban on campus is a bad idea. So what could have been more impactful? Yeah. Picture showing like somebody, somebody's rights being taken away. It's okay. Like yeah. A picture showing someone's rights being taken away. Maybe a chart that shows how this didn't work on other college campuses. Maybe a video of some sort. But the package of cigarettes was not new. It did nothing to enhance the speech. It didn't make it more memorable. Um, the College of Southern Idaho's Writing Center says visual aids should never be used just for the sake of having a visual aid. They can be distracting, they can be cumbersome, annoying, or at the very least, unnecessary. As such, visual aids should be used sparingly and with the utmost caution. Remember, seeing is believing. It's one thing to describe a sunset and quite another to see a picture of it. Words would fail me to describe this. And I know that for a lot of you that are in the Speech 1100 class, your instructor requires you to have a visual aid, so you have to have a visual aid. But just because you have to doesn't mean that you can't really work to have something that's going to enhance your speech. And if you're struggling with that, I'll recommend, again, coming to the Learning Commons, and we can help you figure out what would be a really effective visual aid for it. Um, Sometimes a visual aid can help us see what the mind can't imagine. That's the reason I love to see movies after I read the book, like The Hunger Games. I read that several years ago, and it was really good for me to see the movie because my mind, I couldn't conjure up images of what I was reading. And so seeing the movie was helpful for me because then I could see the worlds that were being described in the book. Um, so sometimes a visual aid is good to take you a step further than your mind allows you to go. 
Next, I want to talk about types of visual aids. Visual aids have come a long way over the years. When I first started teaching about 18 years ago, um, this is what we had. It was all about the poster board. The poster board that was rolled up and then it would fall off the easel. Um, and, and now we don't have to use poster boards. PowerPoint uh, has kind of leveled the playing field. Now we all have the opportunity to have really high tech professional visual aids in a very short amount of time. And so PowerPoint is awesome because it does allow us to have professional visual aids. But PowerPoint is not the only option. And I am by no means anti-PowerPoint, but sometimes our um, less modern brother is a better option than PowerPoint. And I want to show you some of those <coughs> visual aids. But I want you to help me, first of all, before I go over my list, I want you to give me some ideas. What are some visual aids that you can think of? Physical visual aids, like big object. Like an object, OK, good. What else? Uh, video clips. Video, good. An outline? Yeah. Um, photos. Good, photos. Demonstration. Music. You guys are good. You got most of them. Um, I want to go over six different types of visual aids besides PowerPoint, because we'll go over PowerPoint in more detail. But types of visual aids, the first one is objects and props, which you guys mentioned. When Steve Jobs unveiled the new MacBook Air, he needed to show just how small this new laptop was. And the audience was not going to remember the actual dimensions. They were 0.68 by 11.8 by 7.56 inches. No one was going to remember that. It wasn't going to create any sort of emotional connection. So what he did instead is he showed them that the MacBook Air would fit inside a standard manila envelope. And that right there wasn't high tech but it showed the audience immediately what he wanted them to see and it helped them remember something that putting it on a um, you know a powerpoint wouldn't necessarily do he had the actual object in his hands sometimes seeing the actual object will make it easier for the audience to understand and i've got a couple of notes of caution for each of these types of visual aids i'm going to show you if you've got a large audience an object is maybe not always going to be the best option because it's going to be hard for people to see, especially if you're talking, you know, in your classroom, most people can probably see it. But if you're in, um, you know, a more uh, professional setting outside of school, you might be in a big room with a lot of people, and so that's going to be hard. So keep that in mind. You could pass the, vis or the object around, but then somebody's going to drop it, somebody's going to, hey, psh, psh, it's your turn, get the visual, you know, it's going to be very distracting. So that's not always the best. Um, you want to make sure you can figure out a way that everyone's going to be able to see it. Uh, most of the Speech 1100 classrooms, I think all of them actually have a bunker now where you've got the ladybug or the document camera where you can show it. So let's say I'm going to give a speech about, I don't know, um, jewelry and I want to show my rings on there. I can just put it underneath the document camera. It's going to project it onto the screen and that's a way that people can see something that's smaller. The next, you guys mentioned this also, demonstration. A demonstration can be used to show how something is done. So I want you to consider the difference between reading the directions for CPR. Those, that's the definition, or the, uh, not definition, the directions for CPR. But this demonstration would probably be a lot more effective. It's going to get us to remember it. We're going to know exactly what we're supposed to do. There are tons of how-to videos, uh, YouTube, there's HGTV, there's TLC, a lot of different networks and, and um, opportunities for us to see how to do something. So clearly, there's a lot of benefit to that. A um, Couple of helpful tips for a demonstration. You want to make sure that your demonstrations are succinct. So think about if you've ever watched a cooking show, they don't go through the entire process for making the recipe. They show, uh, you know, oh, first we're going to crack six eggs, and then they crack one egg, and then they go to the next thing. So they don't show the whole thing. Make sure it's succinct. You've only got a certain amount of time. Um, also make sure it's well rehearsed. 
you want to, if you're supposed to be the, the expert on this, you want to make sure that you know exactly how to do it before you try and show other people. Um, and make sure it's visible to the entire audience. I had a student once who wanted to give a speech on skateboarding and like it was a demonstration speech and he wanted to give a demonstration on the proper foot techniques and all of that for skateboarding. But the problem is in a room like this, what? What is my problem? Yeah, you can't see my feet. So he had to come up with a plan B and he ended up taking pictures and doing video and then projecting that onto the screen and that made, he was still able to do the demonstration but we could all see it and it was effective. Um, and the second tip is make sure that you have a backup plan in place, okay? And that we're gonna talk about later, um, but always have a backup plan for any of these visual aids. The third type of visual aid is a poster and a flip chart. According to Toastmasters International, they're an international public speaking organization. Um, if you're presenting to a small audience of 12 or so, you might want to use posters or um, flip charts rather than PowerPoint. You wanna make sure that posters look professional. Now I'm showing you this picture because would this, would this water cycle um, poster fly in the real world? If I went into a you know, million dollar meeting that's gonna close the deal, is a, is a poster gonna fly? He's shaking his head no. No, because it looks really, it looks homemade and kind of amateurish. But she's a grade school teacher. The poster flies in that room. So you need to evaluate who's your audience, um, what's the environment that you're in, what are the expectations, your teacher's expectations, the expectations of your clients or whoever you're giving the presentation to, that water cycle thing, that would work in a grade school classroom. It wouldn't work probably in the business world. So make sure you keep that in mind. Um, you can use mat boards or poster boards or foam core or the trifold displays. You've got a lot of different options. Other text-based visual aids would include a flip chart. And flip charts are primarily used when you're doing a brainstorming uh, type of activity. So like for this, if I had a flip chart in here, this would have been a good opportunity for me uh, to use a flip chart. Couple of um, notes of caution. You can also use the whiteboard, let me say that too. So the whiteboard, the flip chart, or the poster. A lot of teachers do not want you to use the whiteboard for your visual aid. And a couple of reasons for that. First of all, if you use the whiteboard, you've got your back to the audience, which is never a good thing. Um, second of all, it often serves as a last minute fill in for a student who forgot that they were supposed to do a visual aid and oh, I'll just write something on the board and that'll serve the purpose. Um, and it's just not always the most effective thing. It's really hard to write and talk at the same time while keeping your body focused on your audience. All of that's really difficult. So that's the reason that the board is not always the best um, visual aid to use. Things to consider. If your speech, if your presentation is timed, writing takes away from that time. So you wanna make sure that you've planned that all out about how long it's gonna be. Um, if you are writing, you need to be careful you don't turn your back to the audience, like I said. And while some speakers can write and talk with ease, for others that becomes difficult. So you might, might wanna make sure that you're comfortable with that. But if you're brainstorming, this is a great option. The fourth type is audio and video, which also you mentioned. There are millions of videos on YouTube that show how to do something, that show clips from movies, et cetera. And you can embed those in your presentation. According to Young and Travis, they have the book Skills, um, Oral Communication, Skills, Choices, and Consequences. They say you wanna make sure you use short clips. They recommend about 20 seconds, but that really depends on the length of your presentation. When I go out and do some of my corporate presentations, they're like five hours long. They're five hour long workshops. And so if I show a five minute video at the end, because we will often critique other speeches, we'll watch them and critique them, having a five minute video at the end of a five hour long presentation is not a big deal. If your speech is only five to seven minutes, you want to air on about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. It depends on what your teacher says, but that's a more appropriate time length. A uh, Couple of notes of caution. First of all, you wanna make sure that your presentation is not primarily filled up with video clips. Um, you wanna make sure that your clip is cued to start exactly where you want it to. You don't wanna be fumbling and futzing with your, um, with your audio visual aids when your audience is in front of you. It distracts from your audience, it affects your credibility if you're fumbling around. Make sure that you've practiced it ahead of time to know that that format works on that computer. Um, I came down here today at 
about 1115 just to make sure that my visual aids were set up and everything was ready to go and that I knew I could flip through my slides and that everything was communicating with each other. And you wanna make sure that you do that. I know sometimes in a classroom setting, it's hard for you to get to the room early, but maybe go the day before or something so you can just make sure that it works. Um, and always, again, have a backup plan in mind. If your visual, your uh, video is not gonna work, have something else that's gonna serve as a, a visual aid. The next is handouts. And there are some differing opinions on the use of handouts during a presentation. Outside of the classroom in the business world, the most common practice is for presenters to provide a copy of their PowerPoint slides before they even speak so that copies can be made for everybody that's in the classroom. Um, most of the time, teachers in the classroom frown upon handouts because it's distracting. If I give you something to look at while I'm speaking, then you're no longer paying attention to me. Instead, you're looking at the handout that I gave you. So a lot of times, handouts are distracting. But handouts can really help your visuals, uh, really help get your message across, too. Because on, um, like if I'm going to show a chart, I'm going to show this chart. This would probably be better served on a handout than on this visual aid, because there is so much going on. I, you don't even know where to look. So if I were having a visual aid, maybe I would want to zoom in right here, but then give you the whole um, chart for your handout so you could see where it fits in perspective. Um, graphs and charts. There are different kinds of charts, and those charts serve different purposes depending on what message you're trying to communicate. Pie charts show how the parts relate to the whole. You can have up to eight segments, but you'll notice these colors are really able to see the difference. There's very little verbiage on here. It's pretty clear. Bar charts, same thing. Not a lot going on there. It's very easy to read. And the thing with this is you need me to tell you what each thing means. You don't know what columns A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D are. And so that's what's really good also about um, bar charts and pie charts is you want to make sure that the speaker is needed. You don't want to make yourself obsolete by having all of the information up on the visual aid. Also, you can recreate a visual aid chart or graph that you find in a source. If it's too busy, if it looks too much like this, recreate the part that you need, all right? Because a lot of times students will come do some research in the reading, writing, and speech assistance area. They'll find a great article that's got an awesome chart in it, and they're like, oh, but there's just so much going on there. Recreate it. Things to avoid, OK? 3D, whole lot of background noise going on there. There's just too much going on on this visual. And same thing with this one, like I showed with the other example. There's just too much going on, and you want to make sure that you simplify the visual aids as much as possible. Most importantly, I want you to remember that you control the presentation. Don't let it control you. These should be your visual aids, not the entire show. And I know sometimes it's really tempting to put a lot more on there to, to use as a crutch. It's like, I don't know everything that I'm supposed to say, so I'm just going to put a whole lot of information up there so that I can refer to that and have that help me out. Um, you can, but that's, it's pretty transparent. Like anybody that's looking at your visual knows what your, uh, what your goal was or what you were trying to do. So we've discussed the reasons for using visual aids and for the different types of visual aids. And now we're going to look at tips for uh, preparing visual aids. Everyone has an opinion about what makes the most effective visual aid, but in doing the research, the theme that keeps coming back and keeps coming back is one of simplicity. Jeff Atwood, he's a software developer and a blogger, and he wrote a kind of a tongue-in-cheek article entitled How Not to Give a Presentation. And in it, he jokingly said, jam-pack every slide with information. Use as many bullet points and words on your slides as possible. If you can't fit it all on one slide, just try a smaller font. And it's you know humorous because it's true. A lot of people do that. They're like, oh, I'll just cram all of this information, and, and it's hard to read. There's a phrase, death by PowerPoint. In fact, if you do research um, on PowerPoint, if you type PowerPoint into Google, one of the first things that comes up is death by PowerPoint, because that's what people use in the business world, and there's so much, and it's not done 
really well. Um, PowerPoint exists and we use it and we use it a lot, but we don't always use it the best way. Gar Reynolds, he, um, he writes a blog on good presentation design and he says we shouldn't ask whether a particular slide is good or bad or right or wrong. Instead, what we should ask is, is it appropriate or inappropriate for a particular context? So much depends on how the visual aid is placed within the context of the presentation, the content, the objectives of what the particular presentation is, and that's gonna determine the effectiveness. You need to evaluate based on the industry, the setting, the expectation of the audience, and the teacher's requirements. And there are 11 tips to um, help you in putting together your visual presentation. First, Dustin Wax, who's an instructor and a blogger, and he writes at lifehack.org, he offers the following advice for putting together a PowerPoint presentation. He says to write a script or write an outline because the purpose of your visuals is to enhance your spoken message. And so you wanna make sure that you know what you're going to say first before you start putting the visual aids in. So for like this presentation that I'm doing today, I wrote my script, then I did my visuals, then I practiced my script with my visuals, and then I edited, and then I did it again, and then I edited a little more, and you wanna make sure that you do that. Second, you wanna keep your audience in mind all the time. All decisions from the images you use to their placement should be done with a focus on your message, your medium, and your audience. Each slide should reinforce or enhance the message, so be selective and edit mercilessly. As a presenter, reducing the amount of information that's directed at your audience, words and images and sounds, is gonna help them better remember the message. In this case, less is more. Number three, one thing at a time. At any given moment, the thing that should be on the screen is the thing that you're talking about right now. Our audience will almost instantly read every slide as soon as it's displayed. And so if you've got four things on the slide, they're gonna be three steps ahead of you and then they're just gonna be waiting for you to catch up. So you wanna make sure that you've only got one thing on there at a time. Bullet points can be revealed one at a time like I'm doing um, and then unveil them one at a time as you, as you reach them. Your job as a presenter is to control the flow of information that's coming at your audience so they don't get overwhelmed. Research has shown that people um, have enough trouble grasping information when it comes at them simultaneously. They can either read the slide or they can listen to you, but they can't do both at the same time. So you need to make sure you control the flow of information. So if it's something with words on it, like this right here, you guys can, you guys can uh, absorb that and understand it in a second. But if it's something with words on it that you really need to understand, flip to the slide, Give the audience a second to look it over and to read it and to digest it, and then begin talking. Give them time to understand what's in front of them. One idea per slide. If you need more than one slide, use it, but do not cram a lot of information on one slide. Many have tried to prescribe what the right number of slides is to have for a presentation based on the time length and all of that. And it's really, a decision hasn't been made. There hasn't been a standard. Um, but you wanna practice with more and fewer slides and see what kind of feels right for you. But you wanna make sure that you don't have slides with two ideas on it. Even if you only took one of these slides at a time, there's just a whole lot of information going on there and it's too much. We're looking at all of this at the same time and it's just too much information to digest. So make sure that you're selective and only show one thing at a time. Next, we already talked about this, but keep it simple. Don't overcrowd your slides. Um, leave empty space. So you'll notice on each of my slides, I've got this white border around it because you wanna have empty space. That white space helps us um, focus. That's the reason like in this room right here, it's all white space so that you're not distracted while you're watching a conference. Um, you, they want to make sure that you're paying attention to what you're supposed to pay attention to. So they keep it simple with the white space. If you ever feel like saying, I know this slide's a little busy or I know there's a lot up there, but then you need to edit it. You've got too much information on there. The goal is to have a slide that can be understood in three seconds. So kind of think of it as a billboard that you're driving past on the freeway. Three seconds. So you might want to eliminate background images or use clear icons. Um, sometimes on PowerPoint, 
there's a lot of different things that you can do. And even some of the templates are a little busy. So you wanna make sure that you select one that's not busy and that doesn't have a lot of other stuff going on. Let your pictures make your point for you. Use photographs to evoke emotion, to present evidence, and choose only images that enhance your spoken words and are of professional quality. No clip art. Clip art should not be used anymore for um, visual aids. There's many more options that out exist out there. Google Images has tons and tons of pictures um, that, that exist that you can use. Make sure that your pictures don't get pixelated. If it's not big enough and you have to stretch it out, make sure it doesn't get all pixelated when you do that because that also um, is just not awesome. You wanna make sure that it's really going to give it that credible, professional look to it. And you also want to look for illustrations that tell a story in a less obvious way. Um, I do a lecture on persuasion, and this is one of the visual aids that I, or the pictures that I use. That guy's trying to persuade the elephant to get onto the scale. And it tells the story just in a little bit different way than you, know, you might initially think. Aim for consistency. You want to use repetition of colors and of fonts. Don't bring color and font in just to make it pretty. You want to make sure that it serves its purpose, that the font is easy to read. Um, you can use a template on PowerPoint, like I said, but you want to make sure you pick one that's a little simpler, not a lot going on. You want to make sure you're using color for contrast and effect, not just, like I said, to make it pretty and colorful. And if you're using handouts, make sure you coordinate them with your slide presentation so it just makes a more uniform, professional package. Fonts. There are thousands of fonts available today. And um, there are some really pretty options, but it's best to pick one that's easily readable. Um, these include the serif fonts and the sans serif fonts. And if you don't know whether yours is a serif or a sans serif, just look it up. Um, it'll tell you. Just look on Google. It'll tell you. Google tells you everything. Um, the fonts work well, these, the serif and the sans serif work well with the limitations of computers, and it's easy to read. Some guidelines tell you that you shouldn't have anything smaller than a 24 font. Everything that you've seen today has been at least a 28 font. Um, that's just, it makes it easier to read and, and you don't have to adapt it to whatever room you're in. Um, next, the amount of text. There's a lot of debate about how much is too much verbiage on a slide. This right here, okay, how much text is too much? Some people say it's the five by five. Five words of text per line, five lines. If this looks too crowded for you, then maybe you want something less. If it doesn't, some people say you can go six, you know, six by six, six lines with six words. It's kind of a personal preference thing, so, but this just gives you an idea of the five by five rule. But even with all of these guidelines, it's still sometimes you can find fonts that are really overcrowded with information. Um, one, one author says, if you put too many words on there, you no longer have a visual aid, you have a teleprompter. And she recommends opting for a smaller number of words. You wanna make sure that you don't let your visual aids take the place of a lot of practice. Like I said, sometimes we put a lot of words on there because it's a crutch for us as the speaker and then we can just read it off there. We don't have to have it memorized or we don't have to be as familiar with our information. Don't let the visual aids take the place of your practice. And next, give credit where credit is due. Cite the sources, cite where you got the information. It's up to you and it's up to you know, whatever the teacher's instructions are, whether you cite it on the actual slide right then or if you put it all on a slide at the very end. That's a personal preference thing, but just make sure you do cite the information that you got. Citing your sources just helps with your credibility. And this should go without saying, but always proofread your sign, nothing can affect your credibility quicker than um, typos and errors on your, on your slides. Um, when we've got one more brief section to go over and then I've got a handout on the back table that goes over tips for preparing and presenting your visual aids. It just gives you kind of a checklist to make sure that, you're, you, that you've remembered everything you need to do. So grab one of those on your way out. And the last thing is tips for presenting visual aids. According to publicspeakingproject.org, once you've decided which visual aids to use and have them prepared for your presentation, 
practice with them repeatedly. Um, if you come to the reading, writing, and speech assistance area, we have a bunker there, so you can practice with all of your visual aids. I know Joyce Holty gives extra credit, um, but you can come there and, and get some extra credit, get some extra help. Even if your teacher doesn't give you extra credit, come there and, and get a little extra help. We can practice with you. No audience benefits from the speaker looking at the time, admitting how off schedule they are, or rushing through the remaining slides because they didn't know how long this was gonna be. We have seen people time and time again who blunder their way through a presentation because they obviously haven't done the prep work. So the number one most important thing you can do is practice. Tips for presenting visual aids. Number one, test the equipment. Show up early. Make sure you know that it's working. Um, you know, you always want to uh, get there a few minutes ahead of time. If that's not an option, like I said, go the day before. Number two, always have a backup plan. So like today, I had my, um, I emailed myself my visual aids, I, my PowerPoint presentation. I brought it on a flash drive. I also had it saved on the computer upstairs. I'm not even kidding. Because I know that a backup plan is necessary because I've had students a lot of times that have come to do their speech and their visual doesn't work and there's nothing I can do to help you at that moment. Murphy's Law, if anything can go wrong, it will. So make sure you have a backup plan in place. And, and implementing that backup plan just is really gonna show how credible and go with the flow you are and that's gonna help you a lot as a speaker. Number three, timing. <clears throat> and we talked about this, coordinate the visual aids with the information that you're talking about. Make sure that what you're saying is being shown on the screen right then. Um, the College of Southern Idaho calls it progressive revelation, which is the idea that we as the audience should never see a visual aid until you're ready to discuss it. Um, and I have in my script, like I've got highlights that say click, so I know when to go to the next visual aid. Um, and, and, and I want to point this out. I mean, you guys, I told you I practiced this several times, and there were still a couple of times when I forgot to click. And so then the word comes up, you know, a few seconds afterwards, and that's going to happen. But you've got to go with the flow, and I've practiced it enough that I know, oh, that's right, I just need to hit advance one more time, and then we're fine. You can incorporate, and you'll notice that I have a lot of blank slides in here. Anytime I'm not showing you something uh, anytime that I'm not saying something that I also want to show you, I'll have a blank visual aid. You can hit the B button also on the, com on the keyboard, and that will go to a blank slide, or you can also just input blank slides in there so that the audience is not looking at something that you discussed 30 seconds ago. Number four, get out of the way of your visual aids. It probably would make more sense in a room like this if I were standing here in the middle, but then I'm blocking my visual aids the whole time. So you've got to adapt a little bit. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to stand at the side and it's okay because I'm still making eye contact with people over there, but you want to get out of the way of your visual aids. Show and tell. Explain the point that your visual aid is making. Don't just put it up there. Also tell us what it is that we're supposed to see. If you have a photograph, tell me who who's in the picture. Um, you know, if you've got some of these things are going to be self-explanatory. I'm talking about timing and I have a bunch of clocks up there. Like that's a self-explanatory thing. But if it's something that requires explanation, then make sure you show and tell. Make sure you look at the audience and not just the visual. But did you see right there? So I wanted to look at the visual because that's where I want your attention first. So I looked at the visual for a second, digested it, and then looked back at you. It's fine, like I wanna look at my visuals each time to make sure that the right thing is up there, and that's fine. But if I direct my whole speech like this, then I'm alienating you, you're not feeling connected to me. So look at your visual aid, make sure it's the thing you want to be up there, and then go back to your audience. And the last one is reliability. Make certain you can rely on your visuals. Pets, people, Automated contraptions, they're notorious for knowing exactly when to let you down. So make sure everything you use is very reliable. I had a student one time who wanted to do a um, uh, swimming safety demonstration. So he had another friend come in and his friend was gonna be like the, you know, the dummy that drowns in the pool. And they kept laughing. They made each other laugh the whole time. So it kind of lost its whole impact. So you wanna make sure don't use other people. Um, don't use pets, don't use things that, oh, it's supposed to do this, but then it doesn't do that and it lets you down at the right, exactly the wrong moment. 
I need someone well-versed in the art of torture. Do you know PowerPoint? Uh, that's what we don't want to happen. Uh, effective selection, design, and implementation of visual aids will increase your audience's attention and will help vanquish, uh, vanquish this whole death by PowerPoint. It'll make you and your message clearer and more memorable, which will help you achieve your primary goal, an audience that understands and connects with your message. Okay? I want to tell you one more thing. Um, in this, the learning commons upstairs, um, and there's a flyer back there that tells this, but we have a Microsoft often Office Applications Open Lab two days a week. So if you want to start working on PowerPoint, you're like, I don't even know how to do PowerPoint. Come there to the Open Lab. We've got um, a coach there that can help you work with PowerPoint, work with actually any Microsoft Office application, but can really help you. So if visual aids are still something that you're struggling with, please come see us and we can help you. Mm -hmm.